Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. This week, we are jumping straight into something pretty significant, I think. A potential breakthrough moment in the UK's fight against HIV. We're talking about the recent approval of a, well, a tool that many are calling genuinely revolutionary for prevention. That's right. And this tool, it's a new long-acting injectable medicine. It's used for pre-EP, that's pre-exposure prophylaxis. Right, PRBP. So HIV-negative people take it to prevent infection. But the usual way has been pills, yeah. Exactly. For years, PRIEP has mostly meant taking a pill every single day. This new option is called cabotegravir, or uh, C-A-B-L-A. C-A-B-L-A, okay. And it's an injection, not a pill. Correct. And that shift from a daily pill to this injection, well, that's what we need to unpack today. Absolutely. So our mission is to get into why this is being called game-changing, how it might tackle some really tricky issues around health equity, and you know what it actually means for that big UK goal, end in new HIV cases by 2030. We've looked at the source material, and we're going to try and give you the context behind the headlines. Okay, let's get into it. So what's really interesting, I think, is that the pills themselves, they work incredibly well. Oral pre-EP is highly effective. The effectiveness wasn't the problem. Okay, so it's not about making pre-EP work better clinically. Not primarily, no. The transformation is all about the delivery, how people actually take it. Hmm. CBLA, as we said, is this long-acting injection for HIV-negative people to cut their risk. And here's the key detail, the frequency. Forget daily pills. This is given just six times a year. Six times. It's basically an injection every two months. Wow. Okay, six times versus, what, 365? That's a massive difference in just the logistics of it all. It really is. And the official policy is now catching up. It's been approved for use on the NHS in England and Wales. Ah, bringing them in line with Scotland then. Exactly. Scotland was already there, and experts are pretty clear this is... Uh, a really crucial piece of the puzzle if the UK wants to hit that 2030 target of no new HIV cases. It seems like there's political will behind it, too. Yeah, there was that quote from West Streeting saying, the approval shows the government's determination to use cutting-edge treatments, save lives, and importantly, leave no one behind. Leave no one behind. That sounds like equity is baked into the thinking right from the start. That's certainly the message. It signals that this isn't just about new tech, it's about who can access it. Which leads us straight to the practical side, because new tech often comes with a price tag. Mm -hmm. It does. Our sources mention a list price for CABLA around £7,000 per person per year, which sounds substantial. It is. Though, as usual, the NHS has negotiated a discount. We don't know the exact figure, it's confidential, but there is a discount from the manufacturer, via V Healthcare. Okay, but even with a discount, that cost must shape the rollout, right? Who actually gets it first? Absolutely. The initial rollout is quite targeted. It's being considered for adults and adolescents um, who are at high risk of getting HIV through sex. So people already eligible for pre cheap Yes, but with a key condition. It's specifically for those where taking the daily oral pills is considered difficult. Difficult. What does difficult mean in this context? Is it clinical reasons or... It seems mostly focused on non-medical factors, mm -hmm. adherence issues, situations where a daily pill just isn't practical or possible for someone. The initial estimate is maybe only about a thousand people will be offered it to start with. Just a thousand. So it's really about targeting that initial high cost where the need for an alternative is greatest. Prioritizing, I suppose. That seems to be the strategy, yes. Yeah. Deploying this you know, valuable and initially scarce resource where the daily pill might be failing, not because it doesn't work, but because of someone's life circumstances, difficulty accessing it, remembering it, or maybe issues around privacy. Right. The privacy aspect. Exactly. But it's also really important to stress CABLA is powerful, but it's not a magic bullet on its own. Still need safer sex practices, condoms, etc. Absolutely. Like oral pre-EP, it's part of a combination approach. It adds a very strong layer of protection, but doesn't replace everything else. Okay, so that focus on difficulty with the pills, that brings us right to why this injection is seen as such a big deal. If the pills work fine clinically, why all the excitement about a different delivery method? Because that difficulty often has nothing to do with medicine itself. It's about life. Yeah. The source material really highlights these uh, significant non-medical barriers that stop daily PEP working for everyone. Like what kind of barriers? Well, things like just accessing the medication regularly can be a challenge for some. Mm. The simple impracticality of remembering something every single day. And maybe most importantly, the need for discretion. 
Discretion. Tell me more about that. Well, think about it. Imagine you're, say, a young person living with housemates or maybe back home with parents who aren't you know, fully aware of your situation or might not approve. Okay. Having that pill bottle around, taking it every day, each time is a potential moment of exposure. Someone might see it, ask questions you don't want to answer. That constant low-level anxiety can lead people to skip doses or just stop altogether. Right. So the injection bypasses that daily visibility completely. Precisely. You go to a clinic six times a year. That's it. That massive increase in convenience and, crucially, discretion. It offers real relief from that daily burden. But let's push on that a bit. The sources also mention really tough situations like people without stable housing or facing domestic violence. Daily pills are clearly hard there. But does an injection every two months solve the core problem if someone's in a coercive environment? Doesn't going to a clinic still carry risk? That's a really important point. It's not a perfect solution for every single difficult circumstance, no. But the key benefit is removing the daily physical evidence in the home. Ah, okay. The lack of a pill bottle itself is a protection. Yes. In controlling or abusive situations, physical objects, pill containers, diaries, phone reminders can be monitored. Taking away the daily pill removes that immediate tangible evidence. So the clinic visit might still be tricky, but it's less frequent and perhaps easier to explain away than a daily medication. Potentially, yes. It could be framed as a general health checkup, perhaps. It creates a buffer zone, a period of months without that daily physical reminder of pre-PE use. It's not foolproof, but it offers a level of protection and possibility that the daily pill just can't for some really vulnerable people. It offers, as the source said, hope. Hope. That really lands the human impact. And this is where the science meets the, well, the messiness of real life, isn't it? The societal challenges. Exactly. If this injection is meant to overcome these barriers, we need to look at who's currently missing out. The data seems pretty stark on this. It really is. The official figures show quite clearly that pre-PP, uh, the need for pre-PP, isn't being identified and met equitably across the board of the UK. So how bad is the gap? Well, look at last year. Almost 150,000 HIV-negative people using sexual health services were identified as needing pre-PP because of their risk level. Okay, that's the potentially. How many actually got it? About 76% either started pre-PP or continued it, which sounds pretty good, actually. It's an increase from the year before. 76%. Okay, right. but equitable. That's the problem. It's not evenly spread at all. The uptake varies hugely depending on the group. Let's break that down because this seems critical. Who is getting good access? The data shows very high uptake among uh, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, or MSM. For white MSM, it was nearly 80%, 79.4%. Okay. And for ethnic minority MSM, it was also very high, around 77.8%. So for these groups... The system seems to be working relatively well. They're getting connected to pre-EP. What? But, but then you look elsewhere. For heterosexual black African women, the uptake rate was only 34.6%. Wow, less than half. And for heterosexual black African men, it was similar, just 36.4%. That is a massive difference, a huge gap in access and uptake. That's a, Yeah, that's incredibly striking. What does that gap tell us? Why such a disparity? It suggests pretty strongly that the current system, which relies heavily on daily pills and maybe is too focused just on traditional sexual health clinics, isn't working for these specific groups. So systemic issues. It points that way, doesn't it? It could be many things. Maybe historic mistrust of health care, lack of culturally specific outreach, language issues, but also critically, maybe that lack of discretion with the daily pill hits these communities harder. And this is where CABLA comes back in as a potential solution for this specific gap. Precisely. It's not just another option. It's potentially a vital tool to tackle these disparities. If you offer something that doesn't require that daily interaction, that daily reminder, you remove a major barrier that seems to be disproportionately affecting these communities with lower uptake. Okay, so we have the tool designed partly to fix this equity issue, but having the tool and delivering it effectively are two different things. How is it actually going to reach people? Well, the initial plan, according to NICE, is that patients will be able to get the injection at NHS sexual health clinics starting in the coming months. Just sexual health clinics, given those waiting list issues we often hear about? And that's exactly the concern being raised, particularly by charities like the Terrence Higgins Trust. Their chief executive, Richard Angel, specifically pointed this out. What did he say? That clinics are already stretched. Waiting times for appointments can be long. Now, if you add a requirement for potentially thousands more people needing appointments, 
six times a year. Yeah, you can see how that could quickly become a bottleneck, especially if you're trying to reach people who already face barriers accessing those clinics. Exactly. So the argument from the trust is, if this is truly going to be transformative, especially for those harder to reach groups, we have to think beyond just the sexual health clinic model. Meaning, deliver it elsewhere. Yes. Explore other settings to ensure it gets out quickly and in ways that are acceptable, maybe even preferable to the patients who need it most. Other settings, like where? GP practices, community pharmacies. Is yep. that realistic for an injection like this? GPs are overloaded already. It's definitely a logistical challenge, no question. Setting up injection services, training protocols, it's complex. Yeah. But the counter argument is, well, what's the alternative? Sticking with the status quo and potentially leaving those uptake rates at 35% for some groups. Right. If the goal is genuinely ending transmissions by 2030 and reaching everyone, the system might have to adapt, however difficult. Maybe it's specific primary care hubs. Maybe community pharmacies could play a role eventually. The point is, the current system seems designed for the groups already achieving high uptake. To reach the others, you might need a radically different delivery approach. That's the debate. Radical decentralization might be necessary. Okay, so pulling the threads together. CABLA isn't happening in a vacuum. It's part of a bigger picture, a wider push on HIV prevention, isn't it? Absolutely. It's one piece, albeit a very important one. And the source materials mentioned other things too, like um, future developments. There was another injection mentioned. Ah, yes, Lena Kapavir. It's further down the line, still in trials, I believe. But the early results are exciting. Why? What's special about that one? It might might make an annual injection for HIV prevention possible. Once a year. Potentially. Imagine that level of convenience and discretion. That really would be a game changer again. Okay, so exciting stuff in the pipeline, but what about things happening right now besides CBLA? Well, the other big systemic change is around testing. HIV testing has been massively expanded, particularly in England. How so? It's being rolled out in hospital emergency departments, routinely. So anyone getting blood drawn in A&E gets tested for HIV? In participating hospitals, yes. Currently around 89 departments are doing it, especially in areas with higher HIV prevalence. It's about normalizing testing and catching infections early. Right. So just to quickly recap for anyone unfamiliar HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus attacks the immune system. Transmission is typically through unprotected sex, sharing needles, or sometimes mother to baby. Correct. And this whole strategy, the new injection, CABLA, Future prospects like Lena Capavir, plus this huge expansion of routine testing. It's a multi-pronged attack. Designed to tackle the problem from all angles. Exactly. And crucially, designed to try and close those equity gaps we talked about. Making sure prevention, whether it's a pill, an injection, or early diagnosis through testing, actually reaches the people who need it most, regardless of their background or how comfortable they feel in traditional healthcare settings. So the big takeaway here for you listening seems to be this. Something like CABLA is revolutionary, yes, but maybe less for the clinical improvement because oral pre -CP already worked really well. Mm, clinically, it's very effective. And more for its power to overcome those real-world, messy, human barriers, the social hurdles, the logistical challenges, the need for privacy, especially for groups who've been historically underserved. It's about making prevention genuinely accessible. Absolutely. And that leads us to a final thought something the source material really pushes us towards. Okay. If we accept that the science is now incredibly strong, we have highly effective prevention tools like oral pre pre -P and now CABLA, mm. then the biggest remaining barrier isn't the medicine itself. It's the delivery system. It's the delivery system. How we get these effective tools to everyone who needs them. So the provocative question is, if these therapies exist and we still see huge disparities in who gets them, how far should our health systems be prepared to go? Meaning, how radically should we change how and where we offer these treatments? Exactly. How far beyond the traditional clinic walls do we need to venture into communities, into different types of healthcare settings, to finally ensure that those groups with the lowest uptake rates get the access they need and deserve? That's the next big hurdle on the road to 2030.